this reputation of being a, a very terrible woman and didn't uh, like anybody and was very dictatorial. She was no ordinary woman. I went up there as a pharmacist to have her design a garden for me. And uh, I found out as regards to designing, that was all right. But when it came to getting accounts out and bookkeeping, she was hopeless. And so I decided that uh, I'd give up pharmacy and go up there and do her books for her. Now, let me think. He went next door. He came in here and asked where Miss Walling lived, and we told him. He was back in five minutes, something like that. He said, I couldn't find Miss Walling, but there's a man there. I said, that is Miss Walling. She looked just like a bat. The appearance of Edna Margaret Walling might go unnoticed today, but in Melbourne in the 1920s, it was cause for comment. That this English woman, brought up by her father in the skills of carpentry and construction, should arrive here, train as a horticulturalist, and go on to be the most influential garden designer and conservationist Australia had seen, surprised everyone but Edna. She had a strength that could cast aside convention. With a group of like-minded women, she built a cluster housing development. The locals called it Trouser Lane. It wasn't meant as a compliment. From simple beginnings, Edna rose to greatness and went on to lead the movement to conserve Australian native plants. Well, Edna was famous because of her writings, her books and her articles, and, and also the, her garden design. And when she died, because she discovered the beauty of Australian plants, uh, we lost a valuable crusader for the wild flora of Australia. These four have a common bond. Their lives, at different times, were touched by Edna Walling. Each of them have seen a different face of the woman whose influence still persists a decade after her death. Did no. uh, Edna ever manage to see your um, satin bow birds? For yes, you? No, it's a very poor bow that's down near the fence, so they make much better ones, but it's been deserted for some months. For botanist Jean Galbraith, Edna was a friend and ally in the cause of Australian plants. Berries are ripe, and they'll stay until early September or... For the young Bill Middleton, it was the articles Edna wrote about the threat to the roadside bushland that he found hard to forget. Thirty years on, he's a forester with a mission. But the birds were, a, for her, a decoration for the garden, you might say. Or life in the garden, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Brian McKeever knew the Edna who created an idyllic housing development with cottages, gardens, landscape and owners resonating to the same harmony. <laughs> he still lives on that estate, in an Edna cottage, working as an architect, following her example. I remember a lovely picnic that Edna and I went on one time up to where the Upper Yarra Dam is now. It wasn't, of course, flooded then. Gwyneth Taylor, as a young teenager before her marriage, enlisted in Edna's cause. Gwyneth lived with and worked alongside Edna on the estate building up the landscaping business that was to be the foundation of Edna Walling's reputation. That's absolutely oh, lovely with its pale pink. pink. Oh, yes, yeah, that's I the prettiest. remember, I think it must have been the first time Edna was really aware of it as a landscaping project. Incredibly, more familiar-looking Melbourne suburbs are only a street away. 
But here, between two gravelly roads, is the Bickley Vale housing scheme that Edna created in the 1920s. She bought an 18-acre cow paddock for £50 an acre, subdivided it, and planned a restful haven for almost a score of cottages. Edna realised her grand plan for a suburb, and doubled her money, by selling to like-minded people, usually women, a package of land with cottage and garden designs included. Today, the cottages have grown up, been extended, but it still remains as a suburb landscaped for living. Edna wrote about much of what she was trying to achieve here, to show others the way. That the cottage will rest upon the landscape in quiet accord, instead of being a dull bruise, must be the unconscious wish of all. She met Edna first in the winter of 34. Gwyneth Taylor was just out of horticultural college. Bickley Vale was different then. It was all open paddock. Well, there were a few trees, a few eucalypts, but uh, quite, uh, I mean, nothing like now. The seedlings Gwyneth planted are now themselves old. The plan has worked. The cottages are hidden, private. I was absolutely thrilled with the place. It seemed to supply a sort of need of something that I'd been uh, looking for without realising it for a very long time, as one does when you're 19. <laughs> and at afternoon tea time, I remember, you know, we went up to um, Old Sonning, as it was then. After we'd finished, just when we were leaving, she said, would I like to come work with her? So I moved up then to Sonning. The house that now bears that name is not the one that was home for Gwyneth and Edna. Old Sonning is gone, but the memories remain. Edna was working on a table in front of the fire at this end of the house. So sadly, you see, we could say nothing because by that time you couldn't, you'd think, wouldn't you, until you've had the experience that all you had to do was take a deep breath and go in. But it's pitch back and the noise is horrific. And so that was how it was, that not even any of her autographed Gertrude Jekyll books or any of the treasure that was really within the yards of me, but I couldn't just couldn't get to, to uh, do that. Edna ran to get a hose and poked it through the little window into her study. And for a, one moment, there was a sort of momentary abatement. The flames died down just as the spray of the hose. And then, of course, the hose broke, you see, so it was hopeless. So we just stood there, could do nothing. efforts to save the little cottage were lost. Everything was gone. With small prospect of sleep that night, we occupied our minds with the planning of a new cottage. By 3 a.m., the plan was complete. Brian McKeever knew Edna as a neighbour when he was just starting out as an architect. His work today includes extensions to many of her original cottages. 
He and his family live in a cottage Edna built for her own mother, in typical style. Most of her houses had that faintly old English uh, appearance, but that's only superficial. The real thing that tells you that it's an Edna house is the special quality of scale, the lowness, the proportion of the windows, they're always just right. That rightness comes from an intuitive designer's heart. Edna had no architectural qualifications. Her formal training was in horticulture. But her English childhood spent playing around the cottages of Devon was enough to inspire this. Although Jan and Brian McKeever have more than trebled the size of Edna's original construction, they've always kept those proportions, that scale that creates an individual house that feels like a home. Edna, planning a house. She worked from the atmospheres first. I think she worked from the, the image, the external feel that she wanted, the internal feel that she wanted, and then she'd have to have walls. It was designed for her mother initially, and uh, we arrived, well actually we came from a, we thought, a fairly small flat in Kew, and uh, the night we moved in was horrendous. We ended up with most of our furniture sitting outside on the front lawn, covered with dry cleaners bags <laughs> in case it rained, because it simply wouldn't fit in here. The house being five, five squares. Five and a half squares. Five yeah. and a half squares in size and designed for one person. She used to often say, that's why I do the work I do. I'm not really interested in plants and gardens and things. I'm doing the job the architects never finish off properly. And uh, she'd say, whenever I go to look at a, um, somebody's garden, there the architect's finished at the wall and he says, that's it. Then I have to come in and do his job, which is bringing the house into the garden. The house always sits close to the ground and it's easy to get out. So there's a feeling of garden right next to you, right close, that linking of garden into the house. I guess that's why it's so pleasant to live here. The first memory I have of meeting Edna, my mother and I were outside there and, and uh, we were pruning. Well, Edna's had a lot to say about pruning and unfortunately I hadn't read her book before I began and uh, we had a wonderful morning, we had a pile this high of, of prunings. <laughs> she walked through, suddenly stopped, what are you doing? And I, in my innocence, said, uh, oh, I'm pruning. Oh, she said started walking on. She got a little bit further along the path and then turned back and said, it is hard to know when to stop, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's been life's big lesson to me. <laughs> I think I apply that to a lot of things. 